This morning uh, with us as well. Don't worry at home. They aren't really hugging each other's necks here either. So um, as we come in to worship this morning, I want to invite you to hear these words from Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. In you I trust, O my God. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior and my hope. I love these words and they're often a prayer of mine. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths and guide me in your truth. That is what we have gathered here to do today, to learn some more about God's ways, to have God minister to our hearts, and to leave this place ready to go out and have him guide our week ahead. Would you join me in prayer? O oh Lord, as we celebrate your love for us this day, May we also remember our role in your creation. May we be as faithful in our love to you and all that you have created as you have been in your love for each of us. Open our hearts to hear you in new ways today. Open our minds that we may discover your will for our lives. Restore our hope and use us to bring hope to those we encounter this week. We ask all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. I had the joy this morning before I came into worship. Uh, this is one of the, the fun parts of virtual living was to watch uh, one of my friends, Tommy King, uh, pastor of Swans Creek Missionary Baptist Church here in Grace Creek, share his message this morning. And he was talking about the feeding of the 5,000 and how Jesus tasked the disciples to go and feed everyone, but they didn't have enough. And he was saying that we need to bring whatever it is we do have, our not enough, to God and to give it to Him and to see what He can do with it. And He began to talk about what Jesus did with the lunch pail that the disciples brought. And it said the first thing He did was to take it and He told everybody to sit down, the expectation that something was going to happen. And then after He told the people to sit down, it says Jesus looked up. And we've talked about that in recent weeks, right? Get out and look up. As all the eyes were on Jesus, his eyes were up. And so we bring what we have to worship and we look up to God. And then it says, Jesus blessed what was in his hands. And blessing, as uh, Reverend King talked about, was the idea that we not only ask God to do something with it and give thanks for it, but it's this idea in which we give God credit for all He has already given to us. And we worship and give thanks, trusting that He'll do whatever it is that's needed for us to carry out what He's called us to do. And so this morning, I, I thought it was a great invitation into worship. 
bring whatever it is you have. He said, if you don't have enough joy, bring what you got. If you don't have enough patience, bring what you've got. If you don't have enough peace, bring what you have. And God will do something with it. And normally at this time, uh, we talk about that when we collect the offering. And then we share the beautiful uh, and rich blessing of the doxology. And so Janice, would you be willing to play that for us? And, and those of you at home, sing loudly. And those of you here, if you would hum along in your masks and not spit all over us. Um, but let's offer up this blessing as we can. This morning we praise God for all he's already given and all that he will do to allow us to carry out the things that he has called us to do. Paul? Thanks, Jen. Our children's chat series is continuing to learn about how to build God's kingdom here on earth uh, through our study of the Lord's Prayer. So I want to invite everyone to uh, join me this morning as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we're continuing. We've talked about how God, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus reminds us that God is everyone's God. Even those people that don't yet love God with their hearts, God has created them and loves them too. And we have talked about how part of how we are kingdom builders is by forgiving one another. We've talked about how we are kingdom builders by remembering that God is going to provide us with everything that we need. And today we are going to learn about being kingdom builders by not giving in to temptation. Now some of you have probably seen little cartoons or commercials where you've got like a little angel good guy on this shoulder. And you've got a little kind of devil looking red guy with horns on this shoulder. And this one is telling you something good to do. And this one is telling you something that you're like, ooh. I might really want to do that, but it wouldn't be such a good thing to do. So new cookies baked out of the oven, and they smell really, really good. And mom has already given you one of those off the plate, okay? And she says, no more until after dinner. And then mom goes out to water the garden or do something else, and you're smelling those cookies. And you're thinking, well, there's a whole lot there. And I could probably sneak at least a piece of one of those cookies, says the little devil guy over here. And the other one says, oh, no, don't do that because mom will be disappointed in you and not be able to trust you. Oh, but she'll never know if you just take a little tiny piece of the cookie. No, 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 you might not get any other cookies if you take a piece of the cookie. Well, if mom's not going to give you other cookies anyways, then you might as well go ahead and eat a whole one now so that you get a whole extra one. And back and forth and back and forth it goes. Well, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus reminds us that if we are going to be kingdom builders, every day we need to start our day by asking God to help us. Help us know what voice to listen to. It says in his prayer, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Here's the great thing about God. 
When we have given our hearts to Jesus, he has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is there to help us sort through which voice to listen to. And so every day you want to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you and help you to know which voice to listen to, which voice, which decision is going to make God's heart happy and pleased with us. So this week, as you're making choices, each day I want to invite you in the morning to pray the Lord's Prayer. And remember that the Holy Spirit is there to help you in making the choices that are going to make God's heart the happiest. Would you pray with me today? Lord, we are thankful for the gift of your Holy Spirit. We are thankful for the example of Jesus Christ in Scripture that teaches us so much about leading a Spirit-filled life. And this morning, as we come to you in prayer, we know there are many that need to be touched by your Spirit today. Lord, where there is anxiousness and anger, may you bring peace. Where there is confusion and uncertainty, may you bring your truth. Where there is loneliness and fear, may people feel your presence in a very real and tangible way this day. Where there is a need for healing, we pray that you would deliver your miraculous healing touch. And Father, we pray that where there is a need for reconciliation, that you will soften hearts and mend broken spirits. We ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, good morning again. This morning I want us to talk about the beautiful themes of Scripture, which are grace and mercy. Grace, receiving that which we do not deserve, and mercy, not receiving that which we do deserve. Grace, receiving that which we do not deserve, mercy, not receiving that which we do deserve. And so as we begin to unpack the depth of those things, I'm going to invite you, if you would, to just sing a verse of Amazing Grace with me. like never before. And so this morning I want you to turn with me in scripture, if you would, to the story of Job. It starts in Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to cover a mere 20 chapters this morning, and hopefully we can do that in 15 to 20 minutes. You know the story of Job well, and it's a story of an absolute mess. It's a story of family dysfunction. It's a story of deceit and frustration, and favoritism, and hatred, and violence, and slavery, and mercy. I want you to hear that again. It's a story of family dysfunction. It's a story of favoritism. It's a story of hatred, and violence, and slavery, and also forgiveness, and redemption, and mercy. Mercy in the mess. I think you'll find in Joseph's story a story that 
Well, maybe all of us can relate to in some way, shape, or form. So, here now the beginning of Joseph's story in Genesis chapter 37. Joseph, the son of Jacob. Remember, Jacob, the brother of Esau. We're talking the early, early, early folks in our history. Chapter 37, beginning verse 1, says, Meanwhile, Jacob had settled down where his father had lived, the land of Canaan. This is the story of Jacob. The story continues with Joseph, 17 years old at the time. I have one of those. Helping out his brothers in herding the flocks. And these were his half-brothers, actually, the sons of his father's wife, Billa and Zilpah. And Joseph brought his father bad reports on them. Now, I can't see your hands at home, but you're welcome to tell stories in the comments. And those of you here, how many of y'all have siblings? How many of you have ever shared a bad report on your sibling? You don't have to raise your hand there. You're welcome to, yeah, Pastor Paul is raising hers. There's a few more. How many of you ever had a bad report shared on you by your sibling? Or maybe not even a true report, all right? We can get a witness here. You know... Reports are shared. In fact, sometimes they're shared with such joy and urgency that we wonder just what's going in the heart of our siblings. It says Joseph came to his dad and he brought bad reports on them. I can see Joseph running in and saying, oh, dad, you're not going to believe this. Oh, tell me, son. Oh, well, you know, my brother, mm, let me tell you what he did. Now, I get to experience this daily, and that's why I love this passage so much, because my youngest son's favorite word, words, each of them, their favorite word, is their brother's name. So when I ask one a question, the immediate response is, but, and then the next sibling's name. And they begin to tell me all about the other one. Immediately. And Joseph here is doing the same thing. He comes to his dad, Joseph, how was your day? Well, dad, let me tell you about, and he puts their names in. And he begins to give bad reports. The story begins with a mm, little sibling rivalry maybe at best and a little anger maybe and jealousy at worst. The youngest son coming in giving bad reports on the older one. Why? Well, maybe because they were doing what he wanted to do. You ever notice that as you're... The, End stages in life, all you want to do is be younger, but when you're the youngest, early in life, what do you want to be? Older. You want to get your driver's license. You want to have that uh, uh, independence, that autonomy. One of my kids asked me the other day, Dad, when can I get a key? A key. A key for what? A key to the house. What do you need a key to that? I just want to have a key. I want to be able to have some responsibility. Now, all I can think of is being locked out of my house if he had a key, right? This idea that, but I want that which I don't have so that I can be somebody that I'm not yet. And Joseph comes and he's got this jealousy and he starts out with this jealousy of his brothers. Let's read on in verse 3. It says, Israel, another name for Jacob here, loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the child of his old age. And he made him an elaborately embroidered coat. Now let's stop there and say, you've got the youngest kid who's given bad reports, maybe false on his brothers. You've got dad who has a favorite child. Now I'm not going to ask you if you have a favorite child, because I know most of your children. So I'm not going to ask you which one you like the best. And please don't ask me, because it depends on the day. But bottom line is, it says Israel had a favorite and he made it known by making him a coat. Now we know all about the coat, right? It's an amazing Technicolor dream coat, if you've seen the musical. Joseph's got his own Hollywood musical. There's this beautiful coat that we all know of. And we know the story, and never have I been taught, and as I've listened to this story so many times, that maybe dad's favoritism wasn't the greatest thing in the world. Just maybe that that wasn't helpful or healthy in the family relationship. You have the youngest kid telling stories on the older siblings. You have dad choosing a favorite and making a gift so that everybody knows that this is my favorite. Would that go over well on Christmas morning? So your kids gather around the tree, you're opening presents, and, and you make a presentation. 
Mom and I have been working on this coat all year, and we're going to put it on our favorite so that all will know that this is our favorite child. Well, man, that's, that's rough. I think Dad probably thought that the older kids were mature enough to understand that. Let's hear their response. When his brothers realized that their father loved him, Joseph, more than them, they grew to hate him. They wouldn't even speak to him. Youngest son telling stories on the old one. Dad playing favorites. Older siblings now harboring hatred in their heart. And what I love is people say, well, you know, I just don't, the Bible doesn't have anything to say to me. Does this sound like a family you know? Could this sound like a family you might know? It gets better. It says, now Joseph had a dream in verse 5, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said, listen to this dream I had. We're all out in the field gathering bundles of wheat, and all of a sudden my bundle stood straight up, and your bundle circled around it and bowed down to mine. Now, Joseph, we read throughout his life, had this incredible spiritual intuition, this discernment, this gift that God had given him that he didn't give many others, where he spoke to Joseph in dreams. And as Joseph is dreaming, God speaks to him in this mighty way and says, hey, you're going to be standing and your brothers bow down. And it's this beautiful spiritual moment. And I would have encouraged Joseph to share that with somebody, but probably not his brothers. You're going to be bowing down to me. See, it might have been good if he went and, and talked to his pastor or maybe his dad but instead he says hey boys let me tell you about the dream I had you're going to bow down to me and so we have this rivalry again and again and these decisions in the family that say I'm going to put myself above you so his brother said in verse 7 excuse me verse 8 you're going to rule us you're going to boss us around. You ready for this? And they hated him even more. More than ever because of his dreams and the way he talked. And he had another dream. And he told this one also to his brothers. I dreamed another dream. The sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down to me. And when he told his father and brothers, his father reprimanded him. Now dad's involved. What's with all this dreaming? Am I and your mother and your brothers all supposed to bow down to you? And now his brothers were really jealous, but his father brooded over the whole business. It was messy. Joseph's life was messy. One of the greatest stories in all of Scripture is full of a mess. And folks, I see, hear people say all the time, there's never been a year like 2020. And there hasn't in my lifetime. But as you dig deeper and you look back generation after generation after generation, you go, you know, there's some folks that have been through it. We have to join just a couple of weeks. Second weekend in October, we normally celebrate homecoming. We celebrate the anniversary of our congregation. 176 years that Mount Pisgah Baptist Church has been in existence. And as I began to think about that, I want you to realize what it is that Mount Pisgah has endured. First and foremost, it opened under Reconstruction. And it dealt with all of that stuff. Then it endured World War II, One, excuse me. And the 1918 Spanish flu, and the Great Depression, and World War II, and Korea, and Vietnam, and all of the chaos between then and now, and it's still here. And pastors have come and gone, and people have come and gone, and yet, God has remained faithful. What you're gonna see in Joseph's story, in the midst of the mess, is that God's mercy shows up time and time again. When we read just the first, those are just the first eight verses, ten verses of chapter 37. You go, this family is messed up. Well, guess what? It gets better. Dad sends his older sons out into the fields. And he says, Joe, why don't you come up and go? I want you to go to your brothers. And they see him coming. And they say, you know what? It's our chance to get rid of this kid. How do they see him coming? Well, he's got his coat on with all those colors. 
and he's strutting out into the field, and he keeps his coat on because they're working, and he's just coming to, to see them. And they see him from far off, and, and they begin to devise a plan. Let's kill him, says one brother. That's one way to get rid of it. Another one says, hey, he's bone of our bone and flesh of our flesh. Let's just throw him into this cistern, this well. It's dry. And he'll stay there, and what will be will be. Reuben, his older brother, stands up and says, hey, yeah, that, that's a good idea. Let's do that. And they rip his coat off him and they throw him in the well. And Reuben says, but I'll come back and, and get him. The tension builds. The chaos gets crazier. It wasn't hard for the older brothers to wrestle him and throw him in. You can hear his little voice, help, help, help. And as he cries out, Judah says, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm tired of hearing his little whiny voice in the well. Here comes a band of travelers. We can make some money off this guy. Won't have to kill him. Why don't we sell him into slavery? 17 years old, okay? So we talk about today's ills, right? Child trafficking, all that good stuff, slavery, the pain. They sell him into that. So they can make money. They take his coat. They kill an animal, slap some blood on it. We'll tell dad he's killed. We've got some cash. The kid's gone and all is well. Reuben, the older brother, comes back and says, well, I was going to set him free. And he comes to the cistern and his brother's gone and he begins to tear his clothes. And we think, wow, there's finally some redemption in this story. And you know what Reuben says? Oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Because I'm going to be the one that has to tell our father. Not, oh my gosh, they took my baby brother and he's gone. And so again, they're turned into this selfishness and he worries about himself and... They go back and Jacob, the father, like Reuben, tears his clothes in distress. And Joseph now is taken down to Egypt in slavery. And he's sold to a man named Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. And here's what it says in chapter 39, verse 2. As it turned out, God was with Joseph. And things went very well with him. He ended up living in the home of his Egyptian master, and his master recognized that God was with him and saw that God was working for good in everything he did. They sold Joseph down the river. But God was still with Joseph in the mess. Now, it'd be great if the story ended here. We say, hallelujah, God was still with Joseph. But... You know that the story goes on and on and on. Potiphar's wife accuses Joseph. So we've got child trafficking and slavery and lying and deceit and favoritism. Sound like a good TV show so far? And now he's down in Egypt and Potiphar's wife accuses him of sexual misconduct. She says, look, he came on to me. It wasn't true. She had done it to him. But now he gets thrown in prison. And so now we have all of the good stuff happening. We've got sex and deceit and lies and imprisonment and slavery and Joseph's in prison now. And he's sitting around and he's going, what in the world, God? And even there we read, listen to this in verse, chapter 39, um, verse 21. But there in jail, God was still with Joseph. And he reached out in kindness to him and he put him on good terms with the head jailer. And so even there in jail, in the midst of this mess created by choices and the people that were closest to him, God is still there. There's mercy even in the mess. Well, the story gets crazier. Of course, there's dreams that need to be interpreted. Joseph's a man of dreams. They find out. He interprets some to Pharaoh. He gets back in good standing and now breaks out COVID-19. Not really, but a famine. And there's no food at home for Jacob and his family, Joseph's dad and his brothers. And so they come and there's this long back and forth and back and forth. But bottom line is the family now who sold Joseph down the proverbial river, it was really a desert, now have to come and beg for mercy because they have nothing. I have to imagine if Joseph in the midst of the famine said, you know, can it get any worse? Really, can it get any worse? Can there be any more discord, any more disharmony, any more mess than there already is? And I've talked to people from all over 
that have said to me, Scott, I don't know if there can be any more chaos than there is already in 2020. Every time I turn on the news, this one's against this one, and this one's happening here, and this one's claiming this, and now this, and now that, and, and, and the frustration and the anger. And how do we find mercy in the mess? Time and time again in Joseph's story, it said, even though this horrible year and years were happening in the life of Joseph, it says, but God was with him. And Joseph saw the mercy of God in the midst of all of this. And when his family came begging for help from a foreign nation, Joseph was in a position to show mercy just as he has received it. And so he does. He shows mercy. He sends them home with all kinds of stuff and tells them they'll bring back your baby brother because he'd heard of of Benjamin, the new baby that had been born, and back and forth and back and forth. And finally, Joseph gets to bless his family, gets to hug his brothers and offer them forgiveness and mercy and grace. And they bring their father to him and there's healing and wholeness found in this family. God brings mercy in the mess. And there's this beautiful statement that Joseph shares, not in the message translation, but in many others, as he's talking to his brothers. He says, what you intended for evil, God used for the good. What you intended for evil, God used for good. We see it again in the New Testament as Jesus was being taken to the cross. They put a sign on it. And in three different languages, it said, King of the Jews mocking him. They intended it for evil, but what did it do? Well, it proclaimed the truth to all who walked by in whatever language they understood. But you intended for evil. God used for good. Now please hear me again. God did not intend the evil. God was not happy when He said, Oh good, they sold Joseph down as a slave to Egypt. I wanted to use him there. I don't think that's how it works. I think He said, Whoa! You knuckleheads! But if you're going to do that, and you're going to make that choice, watch what I'm going to do through it anyway. I think he says to us, in the midst of our mess, in the midst of our mess, when we make choices time and time and time again to make things messier, he said, I'm still there. God is still with us in the mess and wants to offer us his mercy. Then the harder part, to do as Joseph did. Knowing that God had shown up in the mess is to share that mercy with others. You see, Joseph had received in the midst of so much pain and suffering and struggle, he'd received God's presence right there. He'd seen him take the mess and, and make something good out of it. And so when those who had caused him trouble showed up, instead of returning their hatred with hatred, instead of returning their evil with evil, instead of returning their selfishness with selfishness, time and again, Joseph fills their bag to the full and sends them home and calls them back and says, let me show you mercy and give you more than you deserve. God desires that for you and me, and He desires us to share that with others. I remind you that Joseph did this for his family, yes, but his family that sold him into child slavery. And still he said, let me offer you the mercy that God has offered me. We live in a world that tells us that if you think or believe or act differently than I am, then I should dislike you to the point that we scream and yell and holler and hate. It sounds like Joseph's family. Dad had a favorite. The brothers hated it. Joseph kept wagging it in their face. He gets a mess. But mercy cleans up the mess. Are you and I able to look to others and trust that even if things are done that we don't agree with, that God can still show up in the 
midst of those things. Even, even if it's a thing that we think is just wrong and the other side of where we would be. God showed up not to the brothers, but to Joseph in slavery. He said, let me show you my mercy and love so that you can show it to others. Who is God calling you? To whom is God calling you? Sorry, Mom, I'll get my grammar right. To whom is God calling you? To show mercy in your life, in your family, in our world. Because I believe mercy in the mess is what's going to get us through. Let's pray. God, there's a mess. There's homelessness and hatred and hurting. There is war still in which we are part. There's economic woes, there's political discord, there is racial reckoning, there is pain and oppression and frustration. There's a pandemic. There's the closing of some things and the opening of others and people that stand on all sides of it. There are brothers that are hating brothers whether in the physical sense and familial sense or the church sense, God, it's a mess. And you see it and you know it. And so we cry out for your mercy. And we thank you for Joseph's story. That you showed up in the mess. And that as you showed mercy, Joseph got the message and showed it to others. And in that, healing and reconciliation and restoration happened. May it be so with us, we pray. In the name of the one who is mercy and grace, who is forgiveness and hope, even Jesus our Lord. Amen and amen. I want to ask you all to be praying for a few specific folks today that I talked to and, and they asked for this prayer. Um, please be in prayer for Joyce Adams, one of our um, members who's having some surgery this week. Lift her up if you would. Continue to pray for families who are grieving, uh, for Barbara Kane and the Morris family. Uh, we buried Justin, uh, 34 years old this week, and please lift them up in the, the midst of that grieving process. Uh, join us as we continue to celebrate God's Word on Wednesday nights uh, at 7 p.m., uh, we're going to be on Facebook Live, but we're also meeting in person in the Fellowship Hall. We're going to finish up 1 John this week and, and keep rolling through those beautiful letters. Hope you can be with us. Several folks have said to me, I, I feel more comfortable in that smaller uh, space than in the sanctuary. If you uh, feel like you can come to that, we'd love to have you or tune in online. Uh, and be prepared for some announcements of some exciting programs in the fall. As I said, uh, on October 11th, normally we would gather for homecoming. Um, but rather than trying to do that in the chaos of COVID, uh, we're going to gather, um, not try to eat and, and share all of our uh, mess together, but we're going to gather in the backyard. Uh, you can stay in your car, you can grab a chair, you can sit around a picnic table with your family, and we're going to do a, a hymn sing, kind of a drive-in hymn sing outside to celebrate 176 years of God's faithfulness to the people uh, called out to be the church here and to sing some of the great old hymns and to pray together. Uh, and to wave to each other and to celebrate that God is still here showing his mercy even in the mess. Pastor Paul? Our uh, children's um, Bible club mm -hmm. online is on a break for uh, two weeks. We are um, getting our new curriculum all set up. So if you have a child that is sixth grade and below and you are interested in having them part of our next uh, kids uh, Bible club, it is done on Zoom. It's easy to do. I can walk you through it. But I need you to give a call to the church office this week so that we can order a supply bin um, for your children and we will be all set to, uh, to go. So thank you all for that. And now go in peace to love and serve the Lord, to show mercy in the mess. Blessings. Thank y'all.